And we're excited that our next guest is uh, is on the programme. We really are. Like I mentioned in the introduction to the programme earlier on, uh, he is a, a very experienced former commercial airline pilot with over 10,000 hours experience under his belt. And uh, he flew for KLM, I believe, uh, the national carrier in Holland. And uh, he was sent an email from a friend a few years ago asking him for his opinions on you know, chemtrails and contrails and weather modification. And he politely replied that um, if such programmes existed, well, pilots would probably know about them. But that wasn't the end of the story because he started looking into it himself. And what he discovered must have changed his life because he's on a bit of a mission now to wake people up to the reality of geoengineering. It's a real pleasure to welcome to the programme from Den Haag in the Netherlands, lovely country, lovely part of the world, uh, Willem Felderhoff. Willem, welcome to the programme. How are you? Good evening, Richie. I'm very good. Very fine. Thank you. It's an honour to be here on the show. The honour is really yours, Willem. It really is. And thanks to Zen Gardner, our mutual friend, for connecting us and, uh, and getting you on. Well, what an extraordinary thing, Willem, and you will probably be, probably be aware that your presence, your, the fact that you exist, uh, is, is like manna from heaven. It's like gold for, for people who have been talking about chemtrails and geoengineering for years, because people often wonder, where are the pilots? And here you are. Do you want to talk to us about when you got the email from your friend about chemtrails and what you thought of it in the beginning and all of that? Tell us about how you uh, first came to know about it. Well, I was quite aware of it uh, in the sense that I hear people talking about it, uh, about chemtrail phenomena. But um, I didn't look into it because at that moment I was quite uh, having my attention on other things. Um, so I got that email indeed, uh, I received it and I looked into it from my own perspective, my own technical knowledge of uh, commercial aviation and, uh, and, uh, technical aspects of, uh, uh, yeah, turbojet engines. And I came to the conclusion out of that, that it was technically impossible. I thought to have these programs going on besides the fact, uh, who would do this kinds of programs, but, uh, I decided to look more into it, and then I uh, came later on to another conclusion, of course, which opened the door to uh, a new spectrum of all kinds of things which uh, were impossible for my for me uh, before then. Well, Willem, can I just jump in there? When when you initially thought that, well, it's just jet contrails, when you initially looked at it, did you have some sort of a gut feeling or an instinct? Why didn't you just leave it there? Why did you carry on a bit further something must have been kind of niggling away at you yeah well for in, i mean the skies did change uh, the last decades uh, immensely enormously uh, that's the thing for sure so uh, these programs are in overdrive and uh, so because of that it's it's much more visible uh, to see so uh, it's very difficult not to see actually uh, nowadays these uh, ongoing programs so you noticed yourself from the ground or even when you were in the air that the skies were much more full of these trails than they had been previously? Yeah, well, it was from the ground because I don't fly anymore. I don't go in, in an aircraft anymore, also not as a passenger. So it was from the ground that I observed this uh, this uh, this phenomena. And this was after you'd retired from flying, Willem, or, or were, you, were you still working at that time? No, that was, well, it was around the same time about, uh, but then I dived real, really into it in the, uh, in the information. And then, uh, yeah, I became very aware of it and uh, I looked into the, up to, into the skies and it was all over the place. Uh, actually, it was quite interesting because I had a reunion of uh, some pilots at the beginning of this year. We, we were with nine pilots. And uh, we were cycling in the area where the School of Aviation was, where we did our flight training. And these were all pilots, uh, you know, all very experienced uh, training captains, all 10,000 hours plus and uh, very ex- experienced guys. So it was full blown uh, over our heads. And I pointed to the skies and I said, listen, guys, you must, you know, you're your specialist. You know uh, all about cloud formation and cloud dynamics. And uh, if you look at this, you know this is not natural. And they were all looking up. And then they thought, well, no, 
it's no, not nothing weird here actually. So uh, yeah, I was I thought you know it's really amazing that, that th these guys even don't see it. But then three weeks later, I received an email of one of these guys, and he uh, he said, uh, "Listen, Willem, I I didn't see it then when you pointed it out, but uh, since then I'm uh, I'm uh, looking at it, and I'm observing the skies, and now I see it." I'm totally shocked. My whole world fell apart, but I'm very happy that I see it. And now he's full on, uh, also in it. So it it takes it takes a while before you can observe these things, uh, yeah. like in all, in all areas. I mean, geoengineering is one thing, but uh, I mean there are numerous uh, things which are going on and which are clearly not uh, the reality as it is. And it takes a while before the mind, the rigid mind. Uh, scatters and that you can really see it that takes some time I remember so, I remember some years ago when I first came across the phenomenon as a radio presenter well first of all as a person I thought it was crazy Willem you know I, I really did and I, I was polite when I was interviewing people at the time like David Icke and others I was very polite um, I argued but I was polite and I thought afterwards well I didn't think they were crazy, not for a second. I just thought this is way too far beyond anything I can comprehend. How could they get away with it? Wouldn't they be affecting their own health as well? And what could it possibly be about? But of course, I, like yourself, having spent a bit of time then looking up and looking into it and doing a bit of research, I started to notice that some of these trails hung around for a long time. And not only that, but they kind of spread out. So each individual trail would kind of, I used to say, fatten out, become kind of fat and then spread out and leave a milky substance in the sky. And I used to think, Jesus, that's not right, that. There, that, that cannot be the condensation trail. You know, even if it freezes, even if it's at a different attitude, it shouldn't do that. And I started then um, looking into it then. Needless to say, there's massive interest, Willem, in this. I'm going to read a couple of messages and then, and then we'll carry on then about what you started looking into and what you started finding out. We will talk about the Open Mind Conferences as well, which you're going to be involved in. Uh, Matthew says on email, Richie, I want to just say this. I believe that the European flight ban in 2010, uh, which we were told was due to the volcano in Scandinavia, was actually a cover for the beginning of massive spraying over Europe that hasn't stopped since. I've lived in the same town all my life, which saw virtually no air traffic. After the ban was lifted, suddenly the skies were full of planes leaving these thick white trails. And it's been that way ever since, says uh, Matthew. There's a huge amount of interest in this. Uh, a couple of tweets there uh, uh, from Stay Wild on Twitter. I watched many times this summer trails becoming clouds over Ibiza, says Stay Wild in the Balearics. Uh, the order says on Twitter, ask uh, Willem if he thinks that chemtrails are either for poisoning people, changing the climate or changing agricultural areas. We might um, get into those uh, areas now in the next uh, few minutes with Willem. Willem, what about um, what you started finding out then? Because as a pilot, you know, you had to know more about a plane than most people would know. You know that the jet engine throws out water vapour, it leaves the condensation trail, it, it disappears and all that. What did you start finding out when you started looking into, well, what might it be then? What might this substance be in the sky? What sort of answers did you start to find? Well, first of all, the, the formation of a contrail uh, from high bypass uh, turbofan jet engines is highly uh, impossible, actually. The, these engines are uh, made in a way that it's, it's almost impossible to form a, a persistent contrail. Besides that, the, you, have to, you need uh, unique atmospheric conditions to, uh, in order to form a contrail. And these conditions are actually hardly ever uh, there. They are hardly ever present. So uh, in that sense, for instance, a control, uh, persistent control is uh, you need to have a certain conditions. One of it's, it's uh, you have to be an airplane above 30,000 feet. The temperature has to be uh, below 40 degrees centigrade. And you have to have a relative humidity of 67 percent. 
Uh, now, William, we, is that is that scientific fact? Let's go. Through, scientific. Let's, let's, scientific. Let's, let's, let's go through those again, just in case any of our listeners missed those. So, the first criteria is the plane must be above thirty thousand feet. That's number one. Yeah. The second one is you said the air temperature has to be something like what was it, forty degrees? It has to be minus. It has to be lower than minus forty degrees centigrade, and the relative air humidity. Has to be uh, for uh, has to be sixty seven percent for water, so the relative humidity has to be sixty seven percent or higher. So uh, that these are conditions you have to have uh, these have to be present in order to form a persistent contrail. So uh, and that's actually hardly ever the case. I was just I was just going to ask you that. So so those are rare conditions then. That, that, that rare would be rare. Conditions. Okay. So what you see today is, I mean, this, has, this is impossible what you see. I mean, you cannot see a, a control which is from, from, from the whole spectrum of the horizon. You see controls just persistent uh, there of different altitudes. That's, that's physically uh, is impossible. So uh, in, that, in that sense, you know, that, that's uh, science. It's, it's physics. Um, so there must be another uh, reason for it that, that it's there. And we see these things a lot lower than 30,000 feet, don't we, Willem? We see them everywhere. You won't know this, but I spent um, much of the last 10 years in Spain and on the southern most tip of Spain, near Gibraltar, in fact. And um, I'll never forget, in the height of summer, some mornings coming out to blue skies and maybe once every two weeks, Willem, coming out to the uh, tic-tac-toe, you know, the crisscross patterns completely covering the sky and if I'd have known then because it is news to me when you just told me about those conditions there I didn't I actually didn't know that that's the truth yeah. so if I'd have known that then that's an extraordinary thing so yeah that's one thing but another thing is that uh, they officially admitted that they're doing it I mean geoengineering programs they are on for decades that they did you know they did it in the Vietnam war it's there they, they, they and they also admitting it that they're doing this now right now as we speak I mean uh, they, and the, the official narrative is that they do this in order to stop global warming so the geoengineering programs are uh, are there to protect us against global warming that's that's the official narrative, and that's why they spray the atmosphere uh, full with uh, all these heavy metals and all uh, uh, to to reflect sunlight, solar radiation management. That's the purpose. That's why they spray. For instance, in 2009, they already uh, stated that they want to spray 20 million tons of aluminium nanoparticles. That's right. In the atmosphere, that's that's officially. So that's it's not a like a conspiracy or whatever. No, it, but they haven't are, admitted it, Willem. The, 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 now this is interesting because everything you are saying is right, but they haven't admitted it. They've said we we're, we're looking into this and this might be a good idea and that, but they haven't actually admitted that they're doing it. And I could never understand this. I'd love your opinion on this. Why haven't they just said to people this this climate change is deadly? So. What we're going to do is we're going to pump billions of tons of um, microscopic particles of heavy metals into the air to reflect away the sun's uh, uh, rays. Why haven't they done that? Because they probably could sell that to people. I've never understood that. Yeah, well, I, that's that's. I mean, geoengineering first of all, it's it's, it's a very very multi layered uh, operation and programs. It's very difficult to uh, to see exactly what is going on. There are, there are numerous ways uh, of doing it uh, in the spraying or in solar radiation management or in the uh, ionosphere heaters. There, are, it's a multi layered programming. So there's not one method uh, how they do it. Uh, they're spraying with different uh, chemicals, uh, uh, visibly or non-visible. -vis uh, so it's not one one method. But the, the the reason they're waiting for it, I think, but that's guessing that it has to do with legislation, and they're really really working on it to get it uh, to get the legislation uh, through. That's why the uh, the coming summit in Paris is such an important thing, because uh, this this whole year. They uh, were busy to getting uh, the programs uh, legalized and with legislation, um, what what they're now planning to get through. And when they when they have done that, then they can present it as, uh, yeah, as a, as an official program, and offer it as a solution for 
another uh, big problem what they uh, what they will present us which is global warming they already present us uh, the society of humanity they present the humanity with the biggest problem which is global warming which is in a way is true i think it's a very uh, threatening situation what they're doing with this programming uh, with this geoengineering programs but um, but they've actually had to admit that the planet isn't warming and that's why they've They've gotten rid of the term global warming and now they yeah, use yeah. the term climate change. Willem, there's huge interest in this. A number of listeners have asked me to ask you, when this is going on over our houses, what aircraft is being used? Are, are, are they private planes hired for, for doing it? Are they military planes or are they somehow modifying commercial airliners? What do you think? Well, it's both. It's, it's, it's commercial and it's military. So you have military uh, spraying aircraft, tanker aircraft who uh, do spraying, but you also have commercial aircraft who are doing it. Uh, I think uh, certain uh, uh, airliners are uh, involved in it. Uh, they are aware and they are paid for it to be involved in it. Um, so, and then you have the commercial airlines. They are a lot of commercial airlines. They are not aware of it because uh, it's also part of. Uh, the fuel policies, so it's uh, it's it's done as additives in the fuel. Uh, that's the thing. Another thing is that uh, in the commercial aviation, the policy of fuel is it's it's more and more um, merged into a, a single fuel policy. So there's there are not really a lot of uh, different producers of uh, kerosene of fuel. There's there's maybe only one uh, producer of the of the fuel. So it's easier to edit in the. F- to, in the fuel, but um, and they make use of very bad quality fuel as well. They change to bad quality uh, fuel, so that might be also that's also an element of the the fact that you see more of this uh, going on. So, Willem, you believe that yeah. they're they're loading up this particular kerosene with these particles, um, yeah. and because people say all the time, Richie, this this sort of stuff looks like it's coming from the wings of these planes. Um, and that's another thing, Willem, because you often see planes. And when we lived in Spain, we had a pair of cheap old binoculars. You know, they weren't the best binoculars in the world now. Yeah, you, wouldn't yeah. have, you wouldn't have seen that iceberg now, you know, uh, mm. with these uh, binoculars. But uh, they weren't the greatest in the world. But you could see, you know, planes. And I used to look up, Willem, and I used to see these, you know, it looked like there were points on the wings. And it didn't look like air was just streaming off the wings. Mm. It looked like stuff was coming out at two points on each wing making four points and all. Does that mean anything to you? What, what's going on there? Well, that might be the nozzles for uh, spraying military aircraft. Because you can see that at lower altitudes when uh, planes uh, selecting flaps and uh, uh, when they're landing or t- taking off, when they have selected flaps, you see these uh, contrails coming off. That's due to the, uh, the vacuum, actually, of the, which is uh, caused by the flap settings. But if they are at a higher altitude and you see these plumes, uh, aerosols coming out of the wing tips, then it, I mean, might be uh, uh, fuel dumps, but I don't think that's uh, the case if you, if you look at it at that, in, at that altitude. So that might be uh, uh, a military plane which is spraying. Yeah, that's possible. I've got to ask you this, Willem. Uh, by the way, folks, if you're just tuning into the programme, it's 26 minutes past the hour. Delighted tonight that Willem Felderhoff uh, has joined us. He worked for KLM for years. He's a vastly experienced commercial airline pilot who changed his opinion because he looked into geoengineering and weather modification uh, himself after being asked uh, through an email from a friend and what he has found out has led him to go on this journey to, to, to educate people, to wake them up to what's really going on. William, this is interesting. Now, you, I don't know if you're on Twitter. You'll have seen these pictures. I've had a couple of pictures tweeted to me by Mike and you've probably seen these pictures before. I don't know whether they're real or whether they're fake, but they look like the cabin of a plane with no seats in it and all of these barrels all of yeah. these blue barrels. You must have seen this picture before. Are these fake or are they genuine? Well, you have this, uh, this. These aircrafts can be very well. A lot of these pictures, I saw them as well, of course. But a lot of these pictures are uh, pictures from planes uh, which uh, are released from the factory, from Airbus or Boeing. And these are ballast tanks, just for ballast. Right. So they are not uh, tanks with uh, chemicals in it. They are used for ballast, for weight, weight and balance, uh, changing for the 
for the certification of the release and the release of the aircraft to the uh, to the airlines. But uh, I've seen pictures also with uh, these kinds of tanks. But then they had also uh, uh, you know, they were connected with hoses, you know, with uh, with with kind of hoses um, and lines, and that that's different. But if you see these pictures with these tanks, and these tanks are just isolated tanks, and they're positioned in the aircraft without any connection or with lines in between, then then it's these are just ballast tanks for weight and balance. These are not. This not is important, Willem, because. Yeah. You're relatively new yourself to the independent media, but unfortunately, and I'm not having a go at Mike now. Mike, who tweeted the picture, is a really good guy, and Mike didn't know maybe. But in the independent media, people take stuff without asking any questions whatsoever. Mm-hmm. You know, you need to question the independent media more than you do the mainstream media. I'll tell you why, folks, because we know the mainstream media is a pack of liars. It's Pinocchio 101 with the uh, mainstream media. We know that. With the independent media, it's often well-meaning people sharing articles and stuff like that, and they've not looked into it, and it causes more harm. Those pictures with the barrels, which I've seen before, it's, uh, it's, it's ballast, and it's testing the aircraft, as uh, Willem just said there. So there you go. That's really important that you said that. I'm delighted you said that. You can tweet at Richie Allen Show, email Richie at richieallen.co.uk. Willem Felderhoff is on with us, uh, a pilot himself. This is big news, this, when a pilot comes out and says, look, folks, this is what's going on, uh, in my opinion. Here's one for you now. Again, this is coming from our friend in Ibiza. Willem, it's the reason why we have budget airlines, because I believe they are subsidised to do it, says one person on Twitter. Now, I think if you subsidise budget airlines to do it, you might have a problem with secrecy, but it's possible. What do you think of that? Budget airlines are so cheap because they get money to do this. What do you reckon? Yeah, I think that's very possible uh, indeed. And uh, I know some low uh, cost carriers are involved in it. They have... uh, uh, separate uh, spray units and nozzles uh, uh, installed on the aircraft. So now how did are... you find this out now? How did you come by this information? Well, I know that from pe- from technical uh, staff working in uh, in England, and uh, they noticed this because they're working in, in yeah, and around yeah, these yeah. aircraft, so they see this, they, they don't know these nozzles, and uh, so they are aware of this. Um, and I saw pictures of it uh, with, you see, different nozzles, which have absolutely no other function. They cannot have any function than uh, adding uh, uh, substances into the control. So, uh, so yeah, I, I also think that um, uh, airlines are involved. And uh, what I see is that also uh, in lately, the past few months, some senior uh, executives uh, just stepped back from uh, their function, who we were just really very... Uh, uh, into uh, getting higher in rank and blah blah blah, but they just stepped back for no reason. Um, not that that has to do with this, but I was also very surprised that these flag carriers like British Airways and all these big uh, uh, airlines, Air France, that they still exist because they cannot make any money. They're, they're huge companies with uh, the tickets, uh, the fast yeah, yeah. tickets. They're so low. I mean, it's impossible to have this uh, to make any profits on the on the tickets and the cargo market as well. It's 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 very bad. So uh, yeah, I I think the, these uh, these airlines, certain airlines, are very aware are, are involved, and I also think that there is a lot of pressure on airlines in a way that they they are sort of blackmailed. So uh, either you work with us. Or you just stop, uh, your, your airline is, is gone. It's interesting but, that point about executives stepping back from uh, airlines and that. You know, if there is any connection, it's, it's interesting speculation that will. It's interesting. I don't know, yeah. you know, I don't know if, if it's because of that, but I notice it that in, uh, the, in a few flag carriers, just executives, uh, very, uh, you know, eager to get higher, higher in this uh, rank, and they suddenly step back and they just became a. A line pilot and didn't do any extra thing anymore. So they, I don't, I don't know why. I mean, it's speculation, but fact is that the, the ticket uh, fares are artificially low. It's it, it's destroyed this market, and how they make money? Uh, yeah, that's it's a great a, question, that's isn't a good it? Question. It's good, a good question and a really good comment and, from uh, from our friend in Ibiza. I tell you what, we'll yeah. do, William. It's uh, twenty seven minutes to the top of the year. We'll pause for 90 seconds for a quick break. There's um, another two dozen tweets 
uh, has just come in there with comments and points and there's a few emails as well. And then, Willem, you, you come r- right back in then with anything else you want to say because uh, we do have plenty of time. So Willem is going to stay with us then. He's in Den Haag in the Netherlands. He's a former pilot with thousands of hours of experience uh, who's come to believe that there's a very serious, uh, a very dangerous and certainly a hidden, at least uh, hidden where we know what's going on, but uh, they're trying to keep it hidden, a geoengineering programme going on right I was going to say under our noses, right over our noses. Welcome back to the programme. 25 minutes to the top of the air. I've got to race through your tweets and your emails and then let Willem back in. And remember, Willem is um, he's a pilot. He spent um, years flying planes, thousands of hours of experience and flight time and all of that. He doesn't have the answers to everything. You know, about soil and abiotic stress and GMOs and all of that. He doesn't. He's still got a lot of questions himself. Still a lot of areas for him to research. But um, he, uh, he um, you know, he came to the conclusion based on initial kind of scepticism that this could be going on, but looking into it and looking into the contrails and learning that the contrails couldn't possibly happen at the altitudes that they are happening and the temperatures and all of that. And that's where he got into this. Hugely important for us because he's a pilot. Right. Uh, Some of those tweets then coming in. Uh, Paul was on to say, Richie, I suppose the US military would say chemtrails are swamp gas, he says. Uh, Mike was back on to say, I do like criticism as it tells me to look over my research. You can't always get it right, says Mike. Mike, I probably tweeted that picture myself some years ago or shared it. Gary was on to say, isn't it a fact the greater the corporation, the deeper the corruption? Once again, dirty deeds for cooperation, he says. Uh, And Jay Stubbs is on to say, Richie, all aircraft going over Kalini here in South Dublin, going towards the United States, uh, look exactly the same. Jay, what does that mean? Tell us that. Do you mean that they all look the same? I mean, they might. I don't know what sort of aircraft would fly Dublin to America. I suppose Will might tell us in a second. Will might tell us. I suppose it'd be seven, 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 sevens, maybe? Seven, two, sevens? I haven't a clue. Will might tell us. Um, scrolling down, I want to say hi to Sean Madden. How are you doing, Sean? Karen is in Glasgow. Says, I'm liking this, Richie, because I'm just learning about chemtrails myself. Sean said, well, Richie, we know that aerosol spraying is absolutely real. Logically follows aerosols need tanks he says uh, and Angela was on to say she sent me a picture uh, thanks for that Angela I'll retweet that in a couple of seconds as well uh, a couple of emails then before Willem comes back in uh, Sean, was on to, Sean was on to ask Richie who what where why could Willem give his view on why well, it, well he has kind of touched on why I'll ask him again in a second why he thinks this is going on uh, and just scrolling down there, David was on to say, Richie, have you seen this research program on geoengineering at Oxford University? It's a, a, an email. It's a link to a, a, an Oxford study. Dave, thank you very much. I will check that out after the program. Right, Willem, like I told you, my friend, this is huge. Everybody's interested in this. Uh, thanks for staying with me. Um, do you want to touch briefly again on what your own instinct tells you is why? Why do you think? Do you think that, you know, is it sinister? Is it about changing the DNA of people? Is it about our food? What do you think it is deep down, my friend? Well, that's a big question, of course. It's uh, it's a difficult, you cannot answer this question just uh, in a short way. I don't know exactly, uh, of course. It's a multi-layered thing. There are dozens of reasons they do it. Uh, but the main thing is uh, that it is about control, I think. And this is about control of the weather. So they, uh, it's, these are weather modification programs. So the goal is to uh, to uh, control the weather. Uh, that is all documented. That uh, these these programs are there to uh, to control the weather. Um, but then you have another thing, and it is maybe to control uh, humanity in a way. Because if you can control the weather like they do, and uh, we are breathing in the same things which are in, now in the atmosphere. And uh, because we uh, breathe in these heavy metals like aluminium, barium, strontium, and all this, this, this stuff, which is uh, with uh, amazing levels uh, um, there in our bodies, we become antennas and uh, also s- very susceptible for radiation. And then you come into the, uh, the HARP projects and the ionosphere heaters, uh, because those are the devices where they uh, then manipulate the weather with. So I, I think, it, I mean, it has to, it, this has to do with control. 
And uh, if you uh, track back the the, pet, the, pat, the patents, patents, and the companies and the corporations who are into this, then uh, yeah, these are the same names again, and these corporations are only busy with control. We here. must mention, William, at this point to back up what you're saying. Some of our listeners will know this; some of them won't. But um, there was um, an agreement signed in the 1970s. I think it might have been 77 or 78. It might have been 77. It was signed in Geneva, ratified by US President Jimmy Carter. And it basically was an agreement that um, countries would not um, use weather modification or environmental modification techniques um, for, you know, for, for war purposes. And that's extraordinary, William, because... That tells you that as far back as the 1970s, the ability to manipulate the weather was something that, not that they were just, you know, thinking about, but that they probably knew how to do even then. That's serious, that isn't it? When you think about that, why would you be signing agreements not to use weather modification in war unless you could do it, <laughs> you know? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. You and well, I wouldn't agree to sign a a contract that we wouldn't turn into Superman and fly to the moon unless we could actually turn into Superman and fly to the moon. So, you know, that's one that, you know, it, it just came to mind. There are a lot of people are talking about that. There are theories, of course, about affecting the, 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 the planet, what these chemicals do to the planet, what these uh, heavy metals do to the soil, abiotic stress, and Monsanto now has a patented um uh, seed that will grow in soil affected by abiotic stress. We must say that as well. And we also know, Willem, and I know you know this, that the, uh, the, 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 the incidences of people developing Alzheimer's and dementia just goes up and up and up and up. And one of the things associated with Alzheimer's and dementia is, of course, uh, aluminium poisoning. So that's all uh, very interesting uh, uh, very interesting as well. Tell us about getting the message out, Willem, and uh, how you've been going about that and what sort of a reception are you getting from people when you're telling them, hey, look, I'm a pilot. I did this for years and I believe this is going on. How are you doing that, my friend, and, and how are people responding? Well, I live in, in the Hague. I live near the beach. So uh, then uh, in the summer, if, if you're on the beach, then it's you see the sky. And uh, the, not, the good thing of geoengineering is that it's very visible other than radiation. I mean, the, the, the radiation, electromagnetic radiation, which, is, uh, we, we, which we are exposed to, is also high damaging and uh, is causing these health, uh, health problems as well. But it's, that's not visible. So that's diff- more difficult for people to, to grab on. But this is, vi- this is visible. So in that sense, the geoengineering is offering us a, like a portal for people that there is that is a confirmation that there's something wrong because a lot of us are still, uh, you know, uh, trapped in these five senses. And uh, the geoengineer and the chemtrails, if you want to call it like that, you see that. So it's more difficult to uh, to ignore it. So in that sense, uh, it's easier to to point at it. It's 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 more difficult to point at radiation because that's another big thing. I'm very uh, yeah, involved in to get people more aware of the damages, uh, the damaging effects of the radiation we are exposed to in the microwave we're living in. But that's more difficult because you don't see it. Because you don't see it. No, loads of comments on this. We'll ask you about the Open Mind Conference now that you have coming up in a couple of minutes' time. Jay, who's in Kalini in South Dublin, says that all these planes heading out over uh, Kalini, going towards the Atlantic, heading out towards uh, the United States, they all have massive trails behind them. Uh, says Jay. Thanks for that, Jay. Mike was on to say, we know that strontium and barium are used and they react with oxygen. Certainly it heats up, he says. John Foley, how you doing, John? Nice to hear from you. John alleges that one of the biggest um, and most well-known low-cost carrier, uh, uh, Ryanair, uh, he says they're involved, or he alleges they are. Uh, Commercial airlines sign agreements, otherwise they have no flying contract, says uh, John Foley. Does that mean anything to you, Willem? Commercial airlines signing agreements, otherwise they don't get flying contracts. He's alleging basically that that's one of the reasons why the budget airlines agree to do it. They basically are told, do it or you're not going to fly anywhere. Yeah, I, I, I don't know about that. Speculation, I, 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 isn't how it? How exactly that goes, I don't know. and uh, So I cannot say anything about it. I, I think they're very involved in it because uh, if you have really technical modification on the aircraft, yeah, you must be aware of what's what, where it's for and what's... 
uh, what it's doing. So, uh, but I don't know how this this goes into the with the, with contracts and things. How they're being uh, pushed into that. Brilliant. Massey was back on to say, definitely it's to control the weather, to control the people, as Willem says. I believe that in the future we might see mass migrations of people from areas that are being forced into drought, such as California in the United States. Now anybody who's followed the writings of David Icke over the years will know this is something David has been talking about for years, is a manipulation of um, rural areas and the climate and the environment in those areas to force people out of the country and into super cities where they can be easily controlled. He's been saying that for years, uh, has David. Uh, A number of you, including Sean uh, and Mary Roberts. How are you doing, Mary? I know Mary. Uh, Talking about the Monsanto seed and feed and their patents on on, on certain seeds, which I mentioned already. These are all uh, serious points and uh, these are all things that um, you know very well are very well may be uh, a lot to do with why these things are going on. William, tell us about um, open mind conferences and and where they're going to be happening and what you're going to be doing. Uh, the open mind conference uh, will be in uh, Alsmeer, that's near Amsterdam. That's on the 19th of December this year, uh, and it's the second one. We had one open mind conference in June. Uh, this year and that was also in Amsterdam there was a lot of things around it because uh, we had to change location two weeks before but uh, we don't expect that will happen now (laughs) what happened about changing location did somebody object to you having the conference Uh, yeah there were a lot of people not happy with it because uh, um, one of the speakers was for instance Christopher Berlin and he was talking about 9-11 and he he had the links to uh, Israel's involvement in it and Ken O'Keefe was there, and there were, and then the media was uh, all over it with talking about Holocaust deniers and anti-Semites and these kinds of things. So then the location uh, they pulled back, and then we had to find another location at the last moment, and that worked out. And uh, we had the the conference uh, finally it it went through, but uh, there were some difficulties and. Uh, now so much again. for so much for free speech, Willem, huh? Oh yeah, and now it's the same. So we uh, we have it now in three and a half weeks. It's very short notice, but yeah, because so much is happening, uh, you know, the latest Paris attacks and in the Middle East, and people are really waking up on the fact that what they see and read in the in the, in the mainstream media is really not the reality. So, uh, but they yeah they feel the need to connect, come together, and. Uh, uh, share information and that's why I thought let's do it again so that's in three and a half weeks from now Brilliant William I tell you what Mage I think you're very valuable because anybody coming from the profession like yourself I think you've got much more of a chance of getting somebody to listen because we don't need to preach to the converted you don't need to turn up and speak to a bunch of people who already are aware of this it's all about getting this information to people who have never heard it before and you've got a great opportunity Willem because you're a pilot you've got no history you know with the independent media or the alternative media you're a guy who you know it's it's an issue that you've developed an interest in through your job I think you've got a great chance of reaching people I really do is there any link or any website by the way where you like uh, to direct people to where they can uh, find out a bit more yeah, on Facebook we have on Facebook got, because the website is not in the air anymore, and and I don't have the time because I have a lot of other things to do to uh, to to make the website uh, to get it in the air. But on the Facebook page, if you go if you go to Open Mind Conference uh, NL, then you come on the Facebook page, and then there's the information uh, about it. It's on the 19th of December, and we have uh, five speakers. Uh, Ole Damagard is going to speak. Then Ian R. Crane is going to speak. Uh, I'm going to say something. Desiree Rover and John Gonsa Muller. So, uh, and there's uh, it's a good opportunity to connect, come together, and share information, and uh, find ways to act because uh, it's all about that now. Uh, we don't have much time for it, so we need to act. We all have to act. Yesterday uh, or two days ago, so I was contacted by a woman uh, from New Zealand. She was there for for the smart meter agenda. She was just a mother, uh, and she uh, she's completely into the uh, the smart meter agenda in New Zealand. She managed uh, to stop this agenda there. So eight hundred thousand smart meters were not installed because of her work. 
you know that's one person uh, amazing woman so it's all about this we all have to come out of our our uh, comfort zone and do things we don't like uh, I don't like to uh, to speak in public, for instance. But uh, yeah, we don't have a choice. We have to. We're all in this together. We have to all come out of it and act because uh, we live on borrowed time. I really see it like that. And uh, so there, we don't have a choice. Actually, we cannot wait. And in that sense, the geoengineering. I mean, it's it's also it can also be a rabbit hole because it's so it goes so far. It's so multi-layered it's so complicated that you can spend days behind the computer do research and research and research you can also check your water that's three weeks on uh, on aluminium barium strontium and your blood and you have the results and then you see the patterns and then your your uh, you know you can you can have your conclusions and then you can act uh, all the evidence is there willem all the evidence, all the evidence is there, there. So that's the thing it's, it's it's now all about coming out and act really act it's it we 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 should spend less time uh, doing research i mean it's very good and important to do research but we have to do more than only research we have to go out and act and show ourselves well i think that's where you come in my friend having you know you don't have any of that baggage that maybe others do in the independent media when i say baggage not in a negative way but when you've been banging the drum for a long time but somebody fresh like yourself i think it's terrific william thanks for coming on the program stay in touch with us my friend do stay in touch with us and uh, we'll catch up with you again in the new year you're welcome on the program anytime you've got anything new uh, to tell us any information do let us know and we'll make room for you anytime william felderhoff thank you very much